Welcome once again to lesson 16 in our Search for Truth series. Two more lessons and it will wrap up the complete series from Genesis to Revelation. And what an exciting time it has been studying the Word of God. And today, last week, we dealt with the attributes of the Holy Ghost and the benefits of the Holy Ghost and the evidence of the Holy Ghost. And there's one more characteristic and attribute of the Holy Ghost that is quite evident in a person's life when they really receive the Holy Spirit. And that is the issue of holiness. Now that is an issue that is quite controversial today. A lot of people think that it's not necessary to live a holy life and separate yourself from the world, but scripture proves that you do. God is holy, amen? His word is called the Holy Bible. His church is a holy place. And his heaven is a holy heaven. Sin will never enter there. And so it seems just reasonable that we as his children, that would be one of the characteristics that we have when we follow him. And that is to live a life of holiness. And holiness and righteousness be manifested in our lives. And for our very first scripture, I want to read Hebrews chapter 12. And verse 14, it's up here on the top of the chart, but I want to read the complete scripture. And it says simply this, follow peace with all men and holiness. We don't fight about this issue. We just declare what the word of God says. It's not a controversy with us. It's very plain in the scripture. Follow peace with all men and holiness. The second part of that scripture is very clear. Without which no man shall see the Lord. If you're not living a holy, godly, righteous life, the scripture very plainly declares you are not even going to see the Lord. It's a very, very important part of the Christian life. And you may say, well, how do I live a holy life? And this lesson is on some of the areas where we can perfect holiness in our lives, grow into a lifestyle of holiness. Our first scripture here is 1 Peter 1. 15 and 16. Let me read it to you. It simply says, But as he which hath called you is holy, certainly God is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The margin on that word conversation, it doesn't just mean what you speak. The margin said your lifestyle, your entire lifestyle. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. How can a holy God live in a temple that is not living in holiness and righteousness? The Holy Spirit will not dwell in an ungodly vessel. It just makes sense. Of course, your speech portrays also holiness and your complete lifestyle, a lifestyle of holiness. Why? Because 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6 and 6 and 17, it says very clearly that, listen to this, 
What concord hath Christ with Belial, that's the devil? And what part hath he believeth, he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement, verse 16, hath the temple of God with idols? And ye are the temple of the living God. You, me, Christ dwells within us. We took how he fills us with his Holy Spirit, and now his Spirit dwells in us, and that makes us a temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, verse 17, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you be separate in all manner of conversation in all manner of lifestyle separate yourself you no longer act like the world and look like the world and be like the world you're living a life of separation godliness and holiness because you are the temple of the living God and touch not the unclean thing guard your hands be separate. Don't, don't get involved with it. Don't even touch it. Don't contaminate yourself. Withdraw from such a thing. And keep yourself holy. 1 Corinthians. Why? 1 Corinthians 3 and 17. It already emphasized it in that scripture. But I want to just read it again. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Know ye not, here it says it again, that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? He's living in me, so I am his temple. Not just Emmanuel Church. That is his house. But I am also the temple of the living God dwelleth in you. And if any man defile the temple of God, well, this is very, very straight. Him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Verse 17. Which temple ye are? Notice how many times he mentioned temple, 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 temple. Four times in two verses. He stresses that you are the temple, you are the temple. Don't defile the temple. This is where I'm dwelling. If you want to keep the Holy Spirit active in your life, don't defile the temple. Because if you do, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And God will destroy you if you defile his temple. That's a wonderful, wonderful compliment to know that I, a human being, could actually be the temple of the living God. That's, a, that's amazing. That's a miracle. That's how you keep yourself holy, your lifestyle, what you handle and touch. Then Psalm says, what you look at. Psalms 101.3, guard your eyes. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. There's wickedness all around us. The magazines, the literature, the movies, the actions, the things that carry on. I'm not going to look at that and concentrate on that and allow that to defile my mind. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Because I am the temple. And what goes into these gates comes into our body. The senses, the eye gate, the mind, the mouth, the ears, what you hear. They're all gates that the wrong spirits can come in and defile your temple. Don't your eyes and women watch your appearance. 
1 Timothy 2 and 9. What does it say? 1 Timothy 2 and 9. In like manner also women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Modest. Is that a word that anybody knows about in the 21st century? Modesty? Not nakedness, but modesty. Modesty is the opposite of nakedness. And we are to adorn ourselves. Adorn yourself. What's more beautiful than a woman that is properly dressed? Not going around bare, but clothed in modest apparel. Because there are, that's how you keep yourself. And you keep others holy as well. And then Romans 12 and 1. Oh, it says there, Romans 12 and 1. This, I beseech you. I'm begging you. I'm imploring you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable. Oh, you require so much. Oh, you're too strict. Oh, you put too many, there's too many rules. No, it's not our rules. It's not Emmanuel's rules. It's the word of God. And he said, it's just your, re it's just reasonable. It's proper thinking for a holy God to expect a people that serves him and walks with him and belongs to him to be holy and defile not your temple. And be not conformed, verse 2, to this world. Don't go along with the styles and the, and the craziness that's out there. Don't be conformed to them. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. It's a mind change when the Holy Ghost comes in. You have his mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that mind is a mind of righteousness and holiness. And it shows in our overall characteristics, our lifestyles, our living, our appearance. And I know you say, oh, but oh. Listen, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. That's what the scripture says. And that is exactly true. But what's in the heart shows on the outside. And how can you be an example and a witness in this world if you look, talk, act, and be like the world? They can't see your heart. There must be an outward appearance of holiness and godliness. So present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable, just your reasonable service. And in the end, what is the fruit of it? What will it bring forth? Romans 6, 20 and 22, listen to this scripture. Very interesting. For when ye were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Before you were a Christian, you didn't have to be holy. You walk the course of the world. You do what the world does. You act, talk, dress like the world. You were free from righteousness. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin. Now you're free from something else. You're free from sin. And you become servants of God. Not servants of sin, but servants of God. You're free from sin. Ye you have your fruit unto holiness it shows in your life you bring forth the fruit of holiness and in the end everlasting life it's part of the plan to bring you eternal everlasting life in heaven the reward of a righteous godly life and at this time, I want to ask one of our precious, precious young ladies in our church. Her name is Sister Jane Scott. And in fact, her husband is taping this Bible study for me right now. And he 
he's a minister in our church. And Jane is a wonderful example of godliness and holiness. I remember the first, very first service she ever attended at Emmanuel. Let me tell you, she was far, far from being godly and righteous. But God drew her. And I want her to give a testimony right now. God bless you, Sister Jane. I first came to Emmanuel in 2002. I was amazed at the love I felt. I had been in many churches before, but never felt the love of God. Everybody, everybody made me feel so welcome. I wanted God to change my life. In the Bible, it tells us in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When I decided to give my life to God, I had to repent of my sins, which means turn from them and walk the other way. It felt like a whole big cloud just lifted from me. I felt free. Then I was baptized in Jesus' name. My sins were taken away. I was free from guilt. I was free from pain and I was free from depression. Now it's 2021 and I'm still here. God has placed me here. God saved me here. And I had the new birth experience here. This is my home now. God changed me, no one else. I did this change because I wanted to do it. Not because I was forced to do it with a set of rules in front of me. All the holiness is plain and simple. It's in the Bible. I have, I had, I have no desire to cut my hair, wear pants or wear makeup. God has taken all these, took all these desires, these worldly desires away. I want to obey the Bible and the man of God, which is my pastor, which is over me in the Lord, which by the way, has to give an account for me. And I would rather him do it with joy and not with grief. When I came in, I was hopeless. I had nowhere to turn. This was a heaven and or hell issue. I had to make a decision and I changed by the power of God. He took all away my worldly desires away from me. I, look at, I looked at a photograph of myself and saw how ridiculous I looked in baggy pants, a big chains, and piercings on my face. They were placed by me, not by God. God revealed to me that I needed to be holy and I needed to come out from the world and be separate and touch not the unclean thing and then he would receive me. We are still in the world, but we're not part of the world. We don't do the things of the world, like drinking, smoking, drugs, I believe everything I do is in the word of God. No one forces me to do anything. I want to do it because it's my choice. That's how God works. He gives us a choice. One of the scriptures that has helped me in my walk with God is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not unto thine own understanding. In all thine ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. If you cling to the scripture, you can't go wrong. When we come to God, life isn't going to be easy. We are going to have our trials, which make us stronger. We have to lean on, learn to lean on God through it all. We invite you to visit our church. Emmanuel Pentecostal Church, so you can experience the change. And that's what he can do for anyone that gives their life to him. He changes us and we become holy in him. Now we're going to just take a little bit here on the Apostle Paul because he was the Apostle to the Gentiles. And uh, we're going to talk about his conversion in Acts chapter 9. Apostle Paul was uh, commissioned 
to kill the Christians because the Christians worshipped Jesus and he was a devout Jew and he knew that he only worshipped God so he set out on his journey and we're in Acts chapter 9 and verse 3 and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth and he heard a voice saying unto him, his name used to be Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Thou me? Why are you persecuting me? This is a voice from heaven. This is God talking. And he said, who art thou, Lord Jehovah? I know we're only supposed to worship Jehovah God. Who art you? Who art thou, Lord Jehovah? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Remember? He's the Father. He's the Son. He's the Holy Spirit. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Lord Jehovah, you're Jesus, and I'm going to kill everybody that worships Jesus. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, same as Cornelius, what wilt thou have me to do? Same as the ones on the day of Pentecost. What did we do? What do we do now? And the Lord said unto him, And rise and go into the city. It'll be told unto you what you must do. And of course there was a man there that the Lord spoke to him and told him that Ananias, that he had to go and, and Saul was in a certain house and he was to go and pray for him. And he was struck blind at that time. He was three days blind. And Ananias was afraid to go. He said, oh, Lord, he's, he's killing the Christians. He's, uh, he said, no, Ananias, he prayeth. There's been a change. Something happened. Don't be afraid to go. He's a special vessel unto me. So Ananias went and entered into the house and putting his hands on to him, said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, he, the Lord, who is Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight therewith, and the Holy Ghost fell on him, and he arose and was baptized in Jesus' name. And that started his ministry. What a conversion. So God used him. He was he suffered greatly for the gospel. He preached the gospel and and that tells us how many times he was beaten, how many times he was shipwrecked, how many times he was stoned, how all the things, perils in the sea, perils in land. The devil fought him every step of the way. And finally, and he made three missionary journeys beaten, wrote 14 of the epistles in your New Testament and finally in Rome the Apostle Paul was beheaded for the gospel. When that happened persecution began in Jerusalem but the more they persecuted the church the more it spread you see, God will always have a church. And those that have the real thing are willing to die, if it must be, for this gospel. So it started at Jerusalem, and it began to spread all over. went to Samaria and Caesarea and uh, Antioch. First, that's where they were first called Christians in Antioch. Unto, the Bible says, the uttermost parts of the then no world, the gospel spread. And in Rome, the wets where the believers met so, such severe persecution. Can you imagine? Fed to the lions, lit Nero's gardens with human bodies as torches. But they didn't give in. They wouldn't recant. The gospel continued to spread. The days of vengeance Jerusalem was burned down. The Romans burnt 
Jerusalem. They crucified people. History said there were so many crucifixions, there was no trees left. And they were led away captive into all nations. Everywhere you can go in this world, you'll find Jews. And there was a prophecy. And it said, the destruction, Luke 19. Let's turn to that. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Remember, this is when Jesus went into Jerusalem and he knew what was going to happen. All because they rejected the Lord. He was come near, he beheld the city. This is where he wept over it. And he wept over it. Saying, if thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. And he talks about, they're going to, for the days shall come upon thee. Thine enemy shall cast the trench about thee, and compass thee round about, and keep thee in on every side, and they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because, all this happened, why? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. In other words, I preached to you. I taught you. I was in your midst. I visited you. I tried to get you, I admonished you to serve me, to follow me, to give me your heart, but you would not. You didn't know the time of your visitation. How many times have you rejected the Lord? Many of you out there, he's dealt with you time and time again. You have a way of turning it off or saying it later, some other time. In the future. Knew not the time of your visitation. Luke 21 and 24. Just turn over the page. See what that says. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, which happened. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Listen, the last part of it. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Um, in other words, I'm going to turn from you, my people. I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. And I'm going to minister to them. And you're going to be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There's going to come a time now when I won't be dealing so much with the Gentiles anymore. I'm going to turn back and deal with you. Israel is not trodden down tonight. They haven't been trodden down since May 14, 1948. That's when Israel became a nation again. And God started one more time to turn back to his people, Israel. And that's why you hear every day in the news, every day in the papers, everywhere, everywhere, Israel, Israel, Israel. It's a place to watch. Things are happening there, which is telling us God is turning around and he's working with Israel once again. Amen. Now, that ushered in. What happened? They couldn't, they couldn't stop the Christianity movement. They couldn't stop this one God, Jesus name, baptism and the Holy Ghost movement. So King Constantine decided that if he couldn't destroy it, he just join it. Not quite join it. Pretend join. I have a lot of pretenders today. So he said, what we're going to do, I'm going to embrace Christianity, but I'm going to change it. 
so they won't be so powerful. So he had a council in 325 AD. And if you believe any of these things, this is our last page that I'm going to show you here. If you believe any of these things, then don't go to the Bible to support your doctrine. Go to the library, look up the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, and you'll find out where your doctrine came from. It wasn't from God or his word. It was from a king that wanted to weaken Christianity. So that's where the Trinity doctrine was introduced. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent, three separate people in the Godhead. Now we have idol worship in the Godhead. He said, I am. Beside me, there's no other. No before, no after. Nobody. Just me. But they introduced the Trinity doctrine. And most of Christendom today accepts it. That is nowhere founded in the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? You need to check things out. Check out your Bible. Check out the doctrine of what you're putting your trust and faith in. Because remember, I've stressed it over and over. Jesus said, unless you believe I'm he, nobody else beside me, you shall die in your sins. There is no trinity. I'm it. I want all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, all the reverence, me. They introduced, we're going to still baptize, but we're going to baptize babies. So they introduced infant, well, it's not baptism, because baptism means to be immersed. But we're going, to, we're going to call it baptism, and we're going to sprinkle a little bit of water on the baby's head, who cannot repent of its sins. And we're going to say that they're baptized with sprinkling water on it. And they accept it. They changed the formula of baptism when they changed the Trinity doctrine. There's not one God now, there's three. And so we have to change the formula for baptism. And we're going to baptize. We had a whole lesson on that in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Titles, no name, no power. No authority. We did that. We talked about the checks. I put Father, Son, Holy Ghost on it. It's worthless, meaningless. And your baptism is likewise worthless and meaningless. Baptized in the titles. You went down a dry sinner and you came up a wet sinner because your sins were not remitted and washed away. Titles can't do that. There's only one name can wash away sins. And what happened? It worked. It works to this day. Why is there? Why are the churches empty? Why is there no power? Why is there no authority? Why do you go? You feel nothing. You go in with nothing. You come out with nothing. The power is gone. Jesus isn't even there. So there was a great falling away. It worked. And that ushered in the dark ages. And I'm sure there were still people that was true during the Dark Ages. But this caused in Galatians 1 and 8, this caused the apostle to say, I'll just read it from the chart here. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed now one I do want to read this one last scripture here in Timothy chapter 4 1 and 2 because this is what's happened now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times our time some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils these are doctrines of devils. It's pretty strong word, Sister Reynolds. That's what the Bible says. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They don't care what the Bible says. Their conscience are seared. 
with a hot iron. And then 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, preach the word. That's what we're doing. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, reprove, rebuke, exhort. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I don't like this. Don't say that, Sister Reynolds. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I like that. Tell me what I want to hear. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. I'm not going to listen. Not that some of you are already getting ready to turn this off. You don't want to hear no more. And shall be turned unto fables. You know what fable is? Fiction. This is fiction. This is not truth. He said in the last day, they're, that's, they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to be turned to false fiction fables, things that they want to hear. So that's why the apostle said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. I didn't say it. The Word of God says that. So it's very important to check out what you believe. Make sure it's Bible-based and backed. Because eternity is a long, long time. And we all need to be on the right side of right. And in your search for truth, you can know what truth is. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word of God today, because your word is truth. There are no ifs or ands about it. It is forever settled. It's not argumental. It's not up for discussion. It's fact, not fiction. And we thank you that we know you in truth. Bless your people that hear these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.